When we're young, we have an amazing positive outlook about how great life is going to be, but somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refused to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Yes, hello there. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's Join Up Darts. I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty good today. I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. I've just pressed record and see what happens. And but I know it's going to be a motivational show because I feel all motivational. And I've already had a pre-chat with today's guest, and he, he's motivational. And not only is he motivational, he can grow an amazing beard. And I'm always impressed by people that can grow <laughs> amazing beards. I just can't do it. I just look like a, a prepubescent Chinese girl. It, it never kicks on. It just stays. <laughs> He's pathetic, like the wolf man going through the change. Half human, half beardy person, but it never really gets there. Anyhow, it's not about beards. It's a man who, with a fascinating tale of following a course in his life that is nothing but unusual. Now, as the former director of customer and employment relations at TCC, the largest Verizon authorised retailer in America, our guest is no stranger to empowering employees through a powerful cultural movement. Now, a 2016 Gallup report found that 71% of employees are not engaged at work. I would imagine it's more than that, to be honest. 60% of employees employees do not connect with their company's mission and 60% of millennials are open to a different job opportunity and likely to job hop. And this is a static, a static, I can't even say it. This is a statistic that is shocking, even when most of us would nod our heads and say, yeah, that sounds like me. Certainly sounds like me. Well, today's guest isn't just sitting there nodding in agreement, but he's doing something about it. He's trying to change that trend with his organisation called Culture of Good. Now, the programme started when Scott Moorhead, the CEO of Verizon, wanted help to change the culture of his company of 3,000 employees at 800 stores across the US. And ever since then, this cultural movement took off and has spread across the country by helping companies inspire employees to have a positive impact in their community and the world. Now, our guest took that concept and created Culture of Good to inspire other businesses to create truly altruistic programs that can make the world a better place. He believes in order for a company's culture of good to be successful and meaningful, giving back must be ingrained in the foundation of its core values. Now, through Culture of Good, he helps other organisations engage the hearts of their employees and empower them to make the changes they wish to see in their communities. And with a huge amount of charity or enterprises benefiting from these businesses with a heart does he look back and think of his time as a pastor and think this is what i was put on this earth to do this was my true life mission and why is it so hard to get past the middle management of the world don't get me started on middle management when most company owners want their businesses to operate in this kind of way well let's find out as we bring on the show to start joining up dots with the one and only mr ryan mccarty good morning ryan how are you sir Wonderful, David. That was a mouthful. I, I'm uh, I'm humbled by all of that. That was, that was a lot. <laughs> Thank it you was so a much lot. for that intro. It yeah. was good to have yeah. you. I, I can't say t- statistics, but I can say ultra truistic or whatever word. I, I don't I don't think I could say either one this morning. So <laughs> you're doing a great great job with it. Thank well, you. Well, I'm on my 15th beer. I'm 15th <laughs> beer and so I'm surprised I can get that going. But it's I tell you what, this is one of those episodes we're going to cut straight to the chase because I love this. I love yeah. this because I have worked for many companies over the time and they were very much a case of what they could get. And we went to work and we sat at our desks and we weren't engaged. We really wasn't. And when we came up with something creative and brilliant and no, it's not possible, it's not going to fit into the budget, there was always a way that sort of knocked you back. It's never going to change, is it, unless you and me join forces and we start blasting this message across because of the middle management in the world. They're the problem, aren't they, Ryan, the middle management? Well, I mean, anyone that really doesn't understand that a big part of business is the humanity of it, right? Like it's made of human beings. And in order to truly engage people, we have to remember that they're people. And uh, if if we uh, if we embark on business as just like a two dimensional, you know, profit and loss statement, whatever is uh, whatever we decisions we make is based on what we can see on a piece of paper, then certainly we're never going to get there. And and many times middle management that's that's their focus. But if we can get back to the to, to the understanding that what we're dealing with here are human beings that have a soul that have life purpose, that have a calling in life to do something significant, 
and that calling isn't just for those that go off and work for a Red Cross or, you know, the Mother Teresas of the world that inspire us. And we love to read their quotes and we feel something when we read that quote, but we really never have the opportunity to engage the world ourselves and to do something ourselves in that in that space. And I think uh, and I know that if uh, for profit companies can operate their business with the soul of a nonprofit, creating opportunities for their employees and giving them permission to care that that human element of business is brought back in and that that's what's magical about um how the culture of good really took off and where it is now it's 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 to me i b- to be completely honest n- none of this is uh it was in my head when we first started it just it's evolved and grown and and it's become what it is now and it's it really comes down to remembering the human element and the soul of a, of a company no, I agree with that totally. And when I was a, a – the people who have heard me say this, but hey, it's my show. I've got a microphone, so I'm going to say it again. But when I was in um, corporate London, I, I totally – never focused on the profit sheets the performance agreements i just focused in on the staff and made the staff want to do their best jobs and be creative because i always thought if you get the staff really firing then all the other stuff takes care of itself but it never seemed to be a common view it wasn't a view that was held it was always about we've got to hit the targets how we're going to do it well encourage the staff and now if you encourage the staff to think on broader sense not just about their desk not about the work but actually the community as a whole it's got to be it's just got to happen i can't understand why you're not president and we haven't got mr trump in power and you're standing up there not tweeting madness but saying some good stuff because that's what we want isn't it i'm trying and honestly i mean what 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 could go wrong if employees show up to work happy and fulfilled every day i mean it's like it's like you know that what's the worst thing that could happen if all your employees show up and they love and connect who you are as a business and who you are as a business owner to moments in their life that are defining life-changing moments where they're fulfilled and they're happy and they find a sense of purpose at their place of work. Uh, that only good can come out of that. And so when we think about you know the idea between a boss and a leader, that's really what's taken place. A lot of people think because they have authority that they're uh, somehow uh, in leadership. And leadership and authority are two different things. And we've got way too many authority figures and not enough leaders. And when we have leaders that are leading people and leading leaders and not just managing stuff, that's that's when that transition and and the, the shift can take place. But we're we're not there yet, certainly. But that's something that um, I'm screaming from the rooftops, man, and I know you are too. So I appreciate it, the voice that that you've given toward it, man. No, that's a, that's absolutely why I wanted you on it. And I, when, when your story came across my desk, I looked at it, and what I liked about it, there, there was three things. Number one, it's good. It's a culture of good, and I like good. Secondly, I was very interested about Scott Moorhead, the CEO sure. of Verizon, and why he wanted to change the culture of his company, where corporate companies, especially kind of call centre environments, are pretty much like battery hens. And I've been yeah. there. I, I've worked there. And it's like you get in your cubicle and you do your thing and then you leave. And it, it inspiration wasn't part of it. So when you came across Scott, did he light up your world? Did you think he was mad to want this? Did you think to yourself, how the bloody hell are we going to do this, Scott? How are we going to do this? <laughs> Tell yeah, us about the meeting. Great. Oh, that's a great question. So uh, a real, as short as I can make it, I was a pastor at the time in a small town where he had grown up and his family had started the business. Uh, it, his business was growing exponentially. I got up on a Sunday morning to speak and I'm not high, highly religious, fire and brimstone type of preacher. I just got up and inspired people that they should wake up every day uh, with a why that equals their what, that we shouldn't wake up every day knowing just what we do as tasks, but we should know why we do what we do every single day. And if we're inspired by what we do with a greater why, then that that will transform our lives and transform the lives of others. And uh, what I didn't know is when I got up to speak is that the uh, CEO of the largest Verizon retailer in the country was sitting in the audience in my small town of probably 28,000 people. Um, and a small church, about 300 people. And there he was sitting, had no idea. He's not a church goer. His wife drug him to church that Sunday. <laughs> and, uh, 
And, uh, you know, we, he said after, after the church was over, he said, let's grab some, uh, some lunch sometime. And I didn't think anything of it. I didn't know who he was. And I said, sure. He seemed like a cool dude. Um, so we, uh, we sat down over chips and salsa. And uh, that day, what I didn't realize is he was wanting me to give him free advice like a normal pastor would do Mm. on how to bring that message of your why equaling your what into his business because his business was growing exponentially. Um, He knew that the culture of his business was shifting. And if he didn't grab a hold of it while it was uh, at the size that it was and give people uh, permission to care and a reason to come to work every day that was bigger than what they were doing, that over time... Uh, what happens within business is as your company grows, the risk is you lose what made you special in the first place. And he yeah. wanted to hold on to that and make a really special place. And he calls it, uh, he wanted to grow the biggest uh, small damn company in the world. Uh, and uh, so uh, he was asking for free advice. And so he said, how, how can I do this? And, uh, and without hesitation, uh, I blurted out of my mouth, hire me. And that, that was that was not expected uh, for me, and he didn't expect it. And uh, and um, and we we chuckled about it. We talked a little bit more about what we originally came up with on a napkin over chips and salsa was what was called the virtuous circle of success, and that was where employees would come to work uh, and have be fulfilled because they do good in the community. When they do that. Uh, that happiness is going to pass on to the customer. The customer is going to make us the, their choice uh, for where they uh, would want their service um, uh, to pay for their service. And because of that, then it would feed back into that circle. And as the company grew, the more good that the employees could do and the more good the customers can do. So it kind of fed itself. And uh, after lunch, uh, there was no hiring that day. Uh, several several months went by, and Scott was out playing with his five year old son on a skateboard. And like every other thirty year old male out there, thought that he could still be a skater, <laughs> and slipped and hit the back of his head on the concrete, and um, was completely knocked out. When he came to, he walked into the house bloody, um, uh, walked up to his wife, didn't know what was going on. Uh, his wife called the 911. He had to be lifeline and almost died, had three skull fractures, internal bleeding, traumatic brain injury. Uh, and after several months of recovery from that, um, this, this would have been, uh, almost eight months after the original talk over chips and salsa, he, uh, gave me a call and he said, you know, that conversation we had about, uh, your why equaling your what and bringing this into the company and hiring you and, and uh, leaving a legacy that matters and doing something in this world to make it just a little less shitty for other people and make it better for others. Like, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little more. I want you to come into my office. And so I went in there and we had a conversation and, and uh, within, uh, within a few moments I was hired and became bivocational for a while and did the pastor thing so I was in the nonprofit, for-profit world, one foot uh, in both of those. And so I was going from the church where we didn't have any resource at all, but all kinds of purpose, into the for-profit co- or community uh, business sector that had tons of resource, but uh, lacked somewhat in how to connect to a greater purpose and a higher reason in doing what they were doing. And so uh, I... We, we just, Scott and I just embarked on fusing those two things together and not looking at profit as evil any longer, but as a, as a, um, avenue and a vehicle to be able to do some amazing good in the world. So that's, that's kind of the creation story. It, uh, we, we embarked on it with, uh, a, a great opportunity for employees to give back through a, a backpack giveaway where we gave away 60,000 backpacks with school supplies across the country. And it was just one of those aha moments that um, that really shocked people uh, to their core when they were handing a backpack to a kid and the mom was crying and and, um, you know, they would start crying. And now all of a sudden you've created this emotional disruption in a business uh, that typically is, uh, like you said, very much uh, self-centered and focused on how can we grow ourselves. And, uh, and I totally agree with you, David, when you, when you focus on others, it comes back to you and it comes back to you in greater ways. And that's what we've discovered through, uh, the last five years. 
So, so I didn't want to jump in there, but there were so many questions that were popping into my head just from my, <laughs> my experience. Um, number one is salsa and a beard. That's probably not the best lunch to have, I would have thought. I would have, I would have <laughs> That's kept the a, truth. Yeah, I yeah. would have kept away from that one. Um, but when, when you went into the company then, and I imagine yeah. you went into the boardroom and Scott said, look, this is, this is Ryan. I've just hired him. Most of the sort of board people must have looked around and went, what the hell's happening here? What's, what's this all about? How, how, yeah. did that, how did you overcome that? Because it's a big stumbling block to have these ideas of good and knowing our heart of hearts that this is a good thing to do and we should do it, but actually then get past the obstacles that people throw up. Yeah, you know, um, Scott's a very progressive, forward thinker, and and when he when he hired me, and he'll tell you the same thing. People thought he was nuts. As a matter of fact, a couple of people said, "Is this from your traumatic brain injury?" <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, I, I I guess I live with this this uh, idea that everybody loves me, man. So I, I came in not even fully uh, knowing that people were like hesitant with the, my hire and. And I, I came in not knowing how corporate America worked. I had been in nonprofit work for, at that point, 20 years. My, I grew up in it. My family was a part of nonprofit work. Uh, it's what I had thrown my whole life into and had done, um, done every day of my life, really. And so coming into, and, into corporate America, I, I didn't expect anything different. I thought, all right, Scott, at that point, had oh, about 2,000 employees. And I thought, well, here's an opportunity. I've got 2,000 volunteers to go out there and make the world a better place. And that's all I thought. You know, they're all volunteers. You know, I know they're employees. I know they work. But if we can give them some purpose. And so we kind of overcame it, honestly, because that first backpack giveaway was really solid proof that we were onto something significant and onto something that would really create uh, a movement within the business that, um, that the leadership saw tangibly uh, could make a difference, and and so it you know it was it was met with skepticism. Um, several employees felt skeptical. Sometimes when you go out to embark on doing good in the world, sometimes it's looked at like a PR effort or a you know some type yeah. of uh, marketing scheme. And you know because we, people we don't want that. to do extra, Ryan, do they? Jumping in there, people don't want to do extra. You know, oh, I'm not right. paid to go out and plant trees. I'm not paid to do this. You know that there's Right. A, a human element that resists stuff until they can see that other people are getting involved. Now, if, if you go well, over yeah. to TEDx, there's a brilliant thing about uh, how to create a movement. And this guy stands up on a, a hill and starts oh, dancing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah starts you've... dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. It's, that's so funny you bring that up because after we started embarking on this, I saw that video and I was like, that makes complete sense. You just got to be crazy enough to get on on the hill and start dancing by yourself. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, I, I've never, I've never lived in the philosophy that you got to wait around for, to have enough resource or people or, you know, to, to accomplish anything. Nobody that accomplishes anything great in this world or has ever in the history of mankind will ever tell you that they had enough resource and they had enough people. That, that that's never happened. And so, so many times we are, we're held back by what we don't have or who who's not for us or the support we think we need in order to accomplish something. And really, no, no one that's accomplished anything great is ever going to tell you, yep, everybody was for me. I, I It was smooth sailing. I never had any setbacks. Certainly, it's it's just part of it, you know, and, and I think you have to be one of the qualities you have to be is resilient and know that if if you believe in what you have in your heart is the right thing to do, you just got to keep doing it until people see the results. And once they see the results, then they'll jump on. But some people aren't going to jump on until they see the ROI or the results or how it's going to impact the business or the world. You just got to keep doing it. And I, that's the biggest thing is you just can't quit, you know? All right, let's play some words now, and then we're going to delve back into the, the getting it going, because I'm sure that we can spread the culture of good across the world, and people can go into their organisations and say, I've listened to this podcast, this sounds a brilliant thing, it's working, people are inspired, they're encouraged, and this is how we're going to do it. But here's Oprah. The way through the challenge is to get still and ask yourself, what is the next right move? Not think about, oh, I got all of this to be. 
What is the next right move? And then from that space, make the next right move and the next right move. And not to be overwhelmed by it because you know your life is bigger than that one moment. You know you're not defined by what somebody says is a failure for you because failure is just there to point you in a different direction. That's, that's so true, isn't it? That, that's how it's done. You just have to do one thing, but the right thing. So what was your first right thing when you started to overcome the obstacles, overcome the boardroom and actually start seeing some momentum? Yeah, I, th- I think the first right thing that we did um, was ask the question, how do we turn this moment, this aha moment into a movement? Uh, how do we create a predictable cadence around it where it's not just a program, it's not another CSR program, it's not a patch sewn on the outside of the company where we would say, yeah, we've got, we've got this business and oh, by the way, we do some good. Uh, we had to make this more than a philanthropic effort. This had to be uh, something of uh, rather than an arm of the business, this needed to be the very DNA of the company. This had to be the culture. And so when we called it culture of good, we had to commit to that. We had to make a promise uh, to the employees that this wasn't a flavor of the month, that this was something that was going to be predictable, that they could count on it. And this was the culture of the company. That was significant from the very beginning, turning a moment into a movement. And, and so can people do this across the world? They're sitting here listening to this and they think the culture of good. They can obviously come across to your website, but are there sort of um, goodies, uh-huh. are there downloads that they can use that will help them implement the same thing? For sure. We, we you know, and, and again, I want to I want to emphasize this is more than just a philanthropic effort. This is uh, based around and constructed of five promises that we make. As a business uh, to the world, we make it uh, and, and expect our cus- customers uh, to know that these are promises that are made by the employees as well. And that is, we're going to care. We're going to drive the business to a greater success so that we can do more good. We're going to connect with the world and those around us. We're going to inspire others to do more good with us. And we're going to be authentic in our words and actions. Those five promises that construct the culture of good uh, what we've what we've developed over time, and again, David, when we first started, none of this was on the playbook at all. But we we recognize that all right, the bit Scott's company uh, is is different because of the culture of good. Uh, we can validate that through uh, the turnover. Uh, decrease. We can validate that through uh, top line revenue increase during the years that we implemented culture of good, uh, the amount of money spent on culture of good and the return on that. So it made business sense, which was really important because we didn't want to just come out to the world and say, here's a philosophy or theory about how you should do business and why you should do it this way. We wanted to create tools and products as you're asking for other businesses to be able to implement and utilize and manage and, 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 and have within their business. And so we've, we've developed uh, uh, an entire suite of products around this, uh, video modules, manager training. We have a, a radar graph that's uh, – and, and a, most of these are digital deliverables. And so uh, it's not something where you have to hire culture of good to come in and do like culture consulting. Yeah. We can certainly offer that, but that's not – we wanted to ka-ching. make this easy. I've got to say ka for you. Yeah. Do, do the one-to-one training. That's where the money is, isn't it, Ryan? Yeah, but, you know, it's it's really important for us to, like you're asking, how, do, how does this happen as a movement across the world? And the easiest way is to deliver those digitally, to create an opportunity at a low cost for companies to be able to buy video modules, activities for their groups and teams to begin to develop the culture of good within their company uh, and be able to measure that, uh, their success, whether they're winning and growing and whether they're moving the bar on the culture of good. And if, is it really being built within their business? Uh, so, because so many times when we think about culture within business, it's very elusive and we can't really put our finger on it. It just kind of happens. It's organic. And we're making the case that it is possible to build business, uh, culture, uh, around doing good. But in order to do that, you have to have the right tools. And so all of our tools are, are built around those five promises, but they're also connected with um, observable behaviors 
that align with the culture of good, making sure that there's peer-to-peer accountability, making sure, and it's, we're not bogged down with a bunch of bureaucracy and a bunch of headaches and people putting, you know, having to fill out a, su- a survey every yeah. week. It's none of that. It's very quick. It's easy, but it keeps people on track with what what the culture of good is, and it keeps it as part of the conversation to the point now where Scott's company hires You know, the hiring process is influenced by it. The onboarding is influenced one on one skip levels. Um, You know, anytime there's anytime there's a board meeting or uh, a meeting of the minds, the thought leaders of the company culture of good is is uh, is the filter by which the company does everything. That's been really significant. And that has not been the case for the entire five years. That's that's as it's been evolving. and, And as we've recognized that. This really is more than a philanthropic effort. This is an emotional operating system. So let's summarize, because you went through them very, very quickly, the five keystones, the, the five pillars of it all. What, yeah. what, what, was, what was the first one? Yeah, care. Just being a caring person, caring about those around us, like taking, making sure that, and, and sometimes those are big opportunities, like a backpack giveaway, Right. Um, and that can be uh, enterprise level caring for the world. Uh, but we're also asking employees, are you caring for each other? Like if you in a simple way, like recognizing when someone's carrying boxes across the hallway and they're coming up to a, a closed door. We don't think about it sometimes, but if, if it's part of the conversation and part of the DNA of the company, we, somebody's jumping up to help them out. You know, I mean, it's it's in small ways. We're asking employees, we're asking the company to opt in with caring and, uh, and having empathy and, and being good people. Uh, the second one, do you want me to keep going with that? Yeah, kind keep, of, keep going. Cause okay, yeah, it's sure. right through. Yeah. Okay. So this one's, this one's interesting. Drive the business. Um, there has to be a business case to it. People have, you can't, you can't just care about the world and not care about the business because the business is what gives us the resource to be able to care. But here's what's interesting about the second promise. It's not just drive the business, but it's drive the business toward greater success so that we can do more good. So what you're doing is in every department, every meeting, you're connecting the the what we do every day and what we have to get done and the numbers we have to hit with the potential of what kind of good we can do if we hit those numbers. Yeah. So every department has a responsibility and accountability to drive the business. Uh, to to make sound business decisions because if we do that we can do greater good in the world so that's that's a really crucial one that we didn't hit on when we first launched culture of good at scott's company and that's something that um, we should have and and looking back 20 uh, hindsight's 2020 we should have focused on that as well as the care part of it is uh, in the beginning the third one is connect uh, so taking moments during the day to stop and listen and connect with uh, the world and those around us, stopping and listening to the customer, making sure we don't see the customer as just another financial transaction, seeing them as a human being, stopping, connecting, uh, feeling, listening. The, so connect is really important. Inspiring uh, is number four, to inspire others to do good with us. We're expecting employees to be leaders within this space. Uh, we expect companies that are culture good companies to inspire other companies to do good. Uh, so how are we inspiring others more than just being good people? How can we inspire others to do good with us? And then fifth, and this is really important and really we, we, the, it isn't in uh, uh, it's not one through five in the sense that one is the most important yeah. because honestly, the last one is be authentic. And if, if you're going to build a culture of good that's not met with skepticism, and, but it's met with uh, uh, acceptance and, and adopted in and immersed within the business and absorbed within the employees, you have to be authentic with your words and actions. If you're going to step forward and say we're a culture of good company, that's a promise. And, and this is why we call these promises and not values. Because a lot of times what you see in business is values come and go. If it's a good year, they're strong in their values. If, if it's a down year, sometimes their values are kind of fuzzy, right? So this is, this is a promise that we're going to be authentic and genuine. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing good because it's just good for us. We're doing good because we know 
that if it drives a business, we can do greater good in the world and care, connect with others, inspire others as we're still genuine and authentic with our words and actions. So those, those are the five promises. I, I think it's brilliant. And I think it works in so many levels. It works on a personal level. It works on a corporate level. You know, by, by focusing on all these, you're going to be a better person anyway, aren't you? You're going to be a better person at home. You're going to be a better person in your life with your friends. It's just a kind of an extra awareness. And so much of life just whizzes past and you don't really think about it. And you're flying down the road and somebody's got a flat tire. You never really think about stopping. You just think, oh, I've got to get yeah. to somewhere. And it's all these kind of little extra things that will it it make you know i always say i've traveled the world and i would say that 99 percent no i would say 98 percent of people are lovely i would say one percent are evil and another percent are serial killers you know i think it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no i i've traveled around a lot i, I can testify most of the world are just amazing people right yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They don't want anything. They just want to live nice lives, support their family, go to bed with a roof over their head, you know, a full stomach and all that kind of stuff, which most of us in the Western communities will, will sort of know as a sort of norm, but other people will struggle. But yeah. in their core, it doesn't matter if somebody hasn't got any money. It's I tell you what, I don't know if you've seen this, Ryan. There was a guy on my show called Leon Logafetus, and he's got a program on Netflix called The Happy. Diaries. I don't know if you've caught up on this or you've seen I'm this. Not. No, have you, I'm have you got Netflix? Down. I do. Yeah. Right. Okay. So t- today, go to go to Scott and say, look, I'm having the afternoon off. I'm not working here. I've got some. I've got some um, research to do. And uh, yeah. this this guy called um, Leon got into a little um, kind of sidecar, a motorbike and sidecar. You know, like Wallace and Gromit drive around in. Yeah, yeah, sure. In those kind of things. And he drove across the world, um, not paying for fuel, not doing anything, but just relying on the kindness of others. And if he found somebody that really was kind and did stuff and he did amazing gifts back to them and I didn't realize that he was quite wealthy and he literally changed these people's lives but what you see on this program and they're, they're small 20 minute episodes but it's so inspiring is the people that have less are more willing to give the people that had less were kinder more genuine and they would give the last bowl of food even if it was their only bowl of food where traveling through america when he when he started in la he struggled to find anyone to do anything nice for him because people were just so sort of ingrained in it and i think that's yeah. what you're doing on a, a mo- molecule basis you're breaking yeah. down that fabric of self and what we can get and just making that awareness of actually it won't hurt me. It's just time. It's just a smile. It's just assistance to help other people. Yeah, it's it's a, how how do you define true life, mm. right? You know, I mean, when I was a pastor, there was a passage that said, "If you gain life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, you'll gain it." And and I, I think the idea of giving and uh, just being a, a generous person and and being willing to um, let go of things and, and to recognize the, the, the needs of others is a, a call to action, right? Like if you see someone who has a need and, and certainly we can't meet every need and, and I'm not suggesting that in any way, but I, I, I think, uh, and I, and I know that, that when we're uh, at a place of sacrifice and at a place of humility, knowing that, um, you know, that, that could be us. Like there's something, there's something within the struggle of others that connects us as human beings. When we see someone else's hurt and their pain, um, and we're moved by that. We see that many times, David, when we look at, uh, major catastrophes and, and hurricanes that have come through and, and, and you see so many people, regardless of religion or, uh, skin color, culture, education, money, it doesn't matter. Everyone, everyone joins together in a, in a sense of, uh, just being human and, uh, being willing to rescue each other. And, um, and, and I think, I think that that humanity can be a part of our, our daily life, not just in a moment of crisis, but, uh, we can also live as human beings, uh, when, when we see that it's not just, our own, our own, uh, need, but it's, it's the needs of others that are, that are constantly calling out to us. And that, that's where we find life purpose. That's where we discover who we are. And, and, uh, that's where we're reminded 
of our own humanity and of the the reality that that those needs that that we see are, are really uh, a call to to us to do something. Now, in the introduction, I was saying whether this was your true mission in life. This, you know, do you ever think this is what I was put on this earth to do? This was my life mission. Because in the United Kingdom, uh, the the church is it's not like it is in America. In America, and sort of like the Deep South and stuff, it's the families go every Sunday, and it's it's a big thing. Sure. Over in the United Kingdom, I don't personally know anyone who goes to church, and yeah. I see a lot of it as just kind of words people who do go they sit there for half hour they listen to these these sermons whatever and they go back and live their own life by you doing that are you actually taking your kind of religious um aura i suppose your your ability to convey a message to people but now put it into a practical sense which it wasn't there before is this your true mission where it's actually blending what you hope to get from the church but in real life yeah, hundred percent. It's 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 what I thought was the whole idea of faith. I, I I lived under the assumption that faith without works is dead. Yeah. Um. That you can't look at someone who's uh, unclothed and hungry and say, "I'll pray for you." Um. Go and and be warm and leave them. Uh. But rather, a more significant thing to do would would be to not even pray at all. And rather go and get them clothes and get them food. So I think faith faith lives itself out for me in in generosity. I, I feel most connected to spirituality and, and my own faith, and not when I'm in a service on a Sunday morning and listening to someone lecture about who God is and how I'm supposed to live a certain type of life. I, I find my faith more alive and the experience of faith for me uh, are in those moments where I'm um, meeting the needs of others. So yeah, this, this is my life calling. Um, but even beyond that, I think a big part of it is to inspire others and, and kind of be that voice in the middle of the crowd of what you're talking about, where everyone's scurrying around and just doing life and going through the motions and working and getting a paycheck and buying stuff and you know, it's this constant weekly cycle that we find ourselves in. And I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to see myself somewhat as a compass, you know, not, not a map telling people how to get to where they're supposed to go, but more as a compass yeah. that can be picked up in a moment to say, am, am, am I headed in the right direction? Is this really what I was born to do? It's, it's, it's that quote, um, it's been attributed to several different people. Um, but you know, the two most significant days in a person's life is the day that they're born and the day they discover why. Um, and, and that's always, that's always really inspired me. And, and, um, so in, in terms of faith and church and, and all of that, I, I've just, I, I never really connected to the whole concept of, uh, thou shalt not. Um, I, I think faith more lives itself in thou shalt. Yeah. You know, thou yeah. shall do what? Like, how, how are you proving out that you recognize that um, God is a creator and, and people are his, um, his like, creation? You, you can only do that when you honor the creation, whether that's people, the environment, um, the world at large. And if that's in nonprofit work, for-profit work, it's it's just it's just part of what I saw as like okay here's a continuation of what I had always been doing but now there's an opportunity for me to do it in a greater sense um, and have a greater voice in that so I jumped at at the opportunity and I'm I'm so glad I did and so you should it's another way of joining up your dots you your life experience had put you in that position to be the right man at the right place. And uh, I'm going to play some words now of a man who's no longer with us, but he said these words and they created the whole theme of Join Up Dots. And he also talks about finding that thing, whether it's faith or it's karma or whatever, that thing that will push you forward. Here's Steve Jobs. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. 
You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. So what he's saying, and I suppose what we've been saying through the episode, is it all comes down to the individual wanting to do something. And they may not have the answers. They may not know how it's going to be. You're not going to have everything lined up. Your dots are not going to be perfect. But by having that faith that you can make a difference, you can change the culture of a company, you can change your own personal outlook, it all comes down to you just believing in something. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's it's believing in yourself and then also believing in something bigger than yourself. That there's a, like like Steve Jobs was saying, there's fate. There's, um, you know, the the chances of you being born and yet you create, you you won life's greatest lottery, you're here. Um, and, and because you've won that lottery, if you, if you knew that every morning when you woke up, that you won life's greatest lottery, um, that there is a greater chance that you wouldn't be here than there is that you are, um, is a, is a moment that for me, since I was younger has always just, uh, been, been a reminder that there's, there's always something greater going on than what, that I'm aware of. And, and, you know, we know this because we can look back over our lives and we can see where the dots connect. We can see where that even bad decisions we made, the dumb stuff we did somehow, uh, the dots connected, uh, thinking forward, it's really difficult to see that. Uh, but if we're reminding ourselves constantly that the dots always connect, that, if, if we can have faith, if we can believe in who we are and the destiny that's inside of us and the calling that's inside of us to do something great, uh, then, then we, we can also be reminded that because the dots have always connected, that's the track record of our past. Uh, the difficult things. When I, when I was six years old, David, my mom was diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic and uh, within a year ended up committing suicide. Uh, from that, my, my dad, who was a heroin addict, um, had a, a moment where he came to, uh, God and, and just in a plea bargain said, if you're real, take the drugs away from me, take everything. And, and kind of a made for a movie experience was a completely different person. That was back in 1983. Um, but I can see even even having walked through that as a six-year-old child, I can see how that dot connects to what I do on a daily basis now. Uh, would I have preferred that that dot never existed? Absolutely. Um, but it was there. It was not my choice. But looking back, I can see where all the dots in my life, the good stuff, the bad stuff, Things that I'm so happy about, things that I wish would have never happened, all of them connected. So I know moving forward, the track record of my life has always been, uh, even in the moments of my doubt and unbelief, even in the moments where I give up on faith and I turn my back on all of it, even even those, those become uh, what I call nows. And, and life is made of nows. And those dots, as you call, every one of them connect and and they're purposeful and they create the pathway by which we've walked and and that's it's it's a beautiful thing to know that because we can look into our future and and recognize no matter what happens from this point forward it's it's going to continue to lead me on yeah i agree with you totally and i i now see it when when i started this show and i created this show it's very much about connecting our past to build our futures looking back and seeing that we've got all the skills already the life experiences to take us forward but now i also see it as stepping stones where literally yeah. you can have faith that i'll give you an example right i i went off on vacation and two years ago i was recording join up dots and i got down to one episode and that was it and i scrabbled around like a lunatic trying to get people on the show saying oh please you know we need to record shows because i haven't got anything in a can and this time i went <laughs> um on um holiday vacation and my wife said to me you know are you all set and i said yeah i've got no more shows that's it it's to have run out and she said what are you going to do and i went well oh, something good will happen now i never had the outlook before i always panicked and ran around like a lunatic but now yeah. i just know that if i just relax and allow something good to happen something good will 
and sometimes yeah. it's not what I expect and sometimes it's not what I, I want, but it's workable and you take that thing and you sort of work it. Now I'm about sort of lined up for about two months in advance of, you know, guests lined up. So it is, it's that belief of don't stress it. Just do the right things, move forward with faith, be persistent, hustle if you have to, but yeah. don't force it. Just keep on moving forward and magic will occur. Do you reckon? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's what Oprah Winfrey said, right? What's the next step? You know, we try to we try to look at our destiny, our purpose is as though it's one check that we write. And when it comes to us, it comes in a bag full of pennies and we have to spend it every day. And, you know, it's it's uh, caring for others. It's the five promises. It's, you know, doing doing the right thing for the right reasons uh, at the right time. It's those, you know, we spend our life penny by penny. It's not one check that we write. We don't figure it all out. We want we want it that way, though. We want the whole thing to be all, you know, perfectly packaged and handed to us. And, and really, um, that's just that's never been the case. It never will be the case. And you, you really have to say, all right, what, what's my next step then? You know, if it's, uh, you know, making sure that um, <clears throat> the direction that you step is more important than uh, what you may have wanted to step into that you may not be able to. Maybe the timing's wrong or whatever it is. You just have to make sure that the direction you're walking and you're taking the step is in the direction that you know that you want to head. And that that's that's really, really a crucial uh, part of it as well is just knowing you know, this is the direction I want to go. What's my next step? Well, I know what our next step is because I've been building it towards it. And this is the part of the show when we're going to send you on a journey to have a one-on-one -on -one with your younger self. And if you could go back in time and speak to the young Ryan, what age would you choose and what advice would you give? Well, we're going to find out because I'm going to play the theme. And when it fades, you're up. This is the Sermon on the Mic. Ooh, wow. The best bit of the show The Sermon on the Mic The Sermon on the Mic Hey, uh, little Ryan, this is Big Ryan And I wanted to talk to you today um, You are six years old And experiencing a lot of of chaos in your life and um so much is is uh coming at you with um with the loss of of your mom to suicide and, and your dad being a heroin addict and i just wanted to tell you that regardless of what you're facing today that you have such an amazing future in front of you um as you grow up uh, don't forget that that first pimple on your middle of your forehead is not going to be the end of the world when you walk into school that day. And, uh, and, and don't forget to, um, to do the things that you know are the right thing to do uh, as much as possible. And when you fall down and you make mistakes and you screw everything up uh, and the world seems like it's against you, I want, I want you to remember that, um, that people are good and, and people have great intentions and that there's more people for you than will ever be against you. Um, I want to remind you that you're bigger than your worst day. Uh, you're bigger than your worst mistake. No, you're greater than that. Uh, as you embark on the world and, and seek to uh, make the world a better place, uh, don't forget yourself. Um, take care of you. Do the things in your life that you need to be healthy. As, as you embark on life and, and have kids and, and have a wife, make sure you always put them first. Uh, make sure you you prioritize, and you always will. You'll always prioritize. Don't forget this. You'll always prioritize what you value most in life. Uh, but be intentional about it. Uh, don't forget that um, business and, and money and, and success, all that's attainable. Uh, 
Um, but don't miss, miss moments with your kids and don't, um, don't miss moments with your wife that are crucial for, uh, the people that, that you love most and that you care about most. So what's the number one best way that our audience who've been listening to you today, Ryan, can connect with you? Yeah, they can connect on cultureofgood.com. Um, they can always reach out through email as well. I get the emails on culturegood.com, but we're on all the social media, Culture of Goods on everything. Um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, it's McCarty Ryan, M-C-C-A-R-T-Y-R-Y-A-N. Uh, and on Twitter as well. But the, I think the easiest way is just jump on our website, see what, what we're doing and, and what kind of uh, impact we're having. And, and if there's opportunity for us to have conversations to any of your listeners, we'd love that opportunity. Um, we really appreciate just the moments that we've been able to share over this last hour, David. It's been really great, man. No, it's been great to have you on the show. And believe me, people, wherever you are, even if you're sitting in a job that is crappy, it doesn't have to be crappy. It all starts with that one person making a difference. And everything in life, from Gandhi to Martin Luther King, it's all started with a single individual. So you can change. Right. So thank you, Ryan, so much for spending time with us today, joining up those dots. And please come back again when you've got more dots to join up, because I do believe that by joining up the dots and connecting our past is the best way to build our futures. Ryan, thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you for connecting the dots for me today as well. Mr. Ryan McCarty. He's doing something bigger than himself. He's doing something that many people wouldn't even attempt. But his history, his backstory had led him to that point when it was a sort of natural progression to move forward. He just needed to have somebody who could see something in him to be able to do that. And all of us, we all need that person to be able to really sort of say, you can do better than this. You can do that. You can go. And if you're not getting that, then... Look at your surroundings and try to change who you're surrounding yourself with because it's very difficult to shake off those crabs that drag you back to the bucket if they are not willing to think big as well. But surround yourself with big thinkers and then magic can occur. Thank you so much to Ryan for being on the show and thank you so much for every single one of you that have listened to Join Up Dots and are sharing it with your friends. I get emails a lot where people are saying, I will share it with my work colleagues and we're all sitting there listening to it. It really makes it uh, a a groundswell. So thank you so much for that. And until next time, we'll see you again soon. Cheers. See ya. David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free. And we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots. 